I think recently, if you haven't, you're dead. You have seen an increased amount of literature regarding skin of color and dermatological, as well as other medical diseases and disorders. So in 15 minutes, I'm going to summarize what I think are the most important recent literature publications relating to skin of color. My conflicts of interest have not changed since yesterday. Okay, so first thing I want to talk about is atopic dermatitis. So we all hear about filaggrin mutations. They are not as common in skin of color as they are in Caucasian individuals. Folliculocentric lesions are often early and a sign that atopic dermatitis is going to be worse than it is now, particularly in black patients. Paritis may be more severe in skin of color, particularly in Asian patients, but also in black patients. Dyschromia is a major, major problem, which is why you need to interfere very quickly. But also keep in mind that high potency topical steroids can poison melanocytes. And I'm going to show you an example of what that can lead to. And remember that xerosis is more common in skin of color. Hydration is very important. And ceramides are the best way to hydrate. So let me just show you a few examples from my own patient population relating to that publication. You can see clearly here the folliculocentric accentuation of atopic dermatitis. That's a harbinger of things that are yet to come, which will be worse. I think I don't need to show too many of these kind of pictures. Hyperpigmentation, post-inflammatory pigmentation, big problem, start early, be aggressive, treating atopic dermatitis in skin of color. And then look at this. This is a Hispanic boy. He's about 17 now. And he just was brought by his mom to see me because he's been using steroids on his antecubital and popliteal fossa for about a decade from his primary care provider for his atopic dermatitis. And yeah, his atopic dermatitis is well controlled, but now he's self-conscious about this. He had the same thing in his popliteal fossa because potent topical steroids poison melanocytes. So if you're going to use steroids, we have other options now and more to come. If you're going to use steroids, try and keep it at the lowest potency or taper down to the lowest potency. We have publications now that are pointing out that skin cancer occurs in skin of color. Like this has not ever been known before. It's amazing to me because in 1982, I wrote a paper about Bowen's disease in black patients, and in 1987, a paper about basal cell carcinoma in black patients. Two things important from these. Squamous cell carcinoma in situ, Bowen's disease, tends to favor the forelegs, and basal cell carcinomas tend to be pigmented and may suggest things like seborrheic keratosis. If in doubt, biopsy. But the other major overarching point to be made from new papers as well as these old papers, skin cancer is not a discriminating disorder. It will affect anybody of any racial or ethnic background. Melanoma, we do have a bit of a problem here. Yes, it's more common in white individuals, but the real problem is the disparity in morbidity and mortality. Five-year disease-free survival, that's DFS, is almost 93% in all comers in Caucasians, but only 74% in black patients. Why is that? Because there is an inherent difference in where the lesions occur. In black patients, often they're acrolentiginous melanoma. That can occur on the bottom of the foot. It can occur between the, the toe webs, and they're often not even looked at on a physical examination. So therefore, they're diagnosed later, and the prognosis is worse. And I think that the underlying theme in that is that there's a lack of suspicion. People feel, well, there's more melanin in this patient's skin, therefore, they're at less risk. Yes, but it doesn't reduce the risk to zero. So here are three malignant melanomas on the bottom of the foot in black patients. 
the two on each side there were sent to me by colleagues. The one in the middle is my patient, who was told he had a wart on his heel, and he was getting repeated episodes of liquid nitrogen. And when it got to be so big that he had to cut out something in the back of his shoe to put on a shoe, the person taking care of him said, oh, why don't you go see this academic dermatologist? Maybe he can figure out a way to get rid of your wart, melanoma. But here's the thing I want to point out to you most of all. Along the line that differentiates the darker pigmented top of the foot and the less pigmented sole of the foot, you can draw a straight line. On that line, African-American individuals, black individuals, are more likely to develop melanoma. And they don't have to look as horrid as the last three examples I showed you. I want you to look at these two. They're my patients. And I want you to think to yourself, you saw this during a general exam. You saw it because they had a planter's wart. You saw this lesion because they had onychomycosis or some other reason they took their shoes and socks off and you saw these. Would you worry about them? The one on the top there is malignant melanoma in situ. The one on the bottom is an acrolentigenous invasive malignant melanoma. And they don't look terribly bad from a gross perspective. If you see a pigmented lesion that stands out to you, and it's along that line between the hyperpigmented dorsum of the foot and the less pigmented sole of the foot, right along that line, think melanoma. Pull out your dermatoscope. If it at all looks vaguely suspicious, I know we don't like to biopsy the foot very much. I don't, you don't. You can leave a permanently painful scar, but you need to biopsy. I can honestly say I saved those two people's lives, and I'd like you to do the same. How about this one? This one was decided to come to dermatology after being told by their primary care physician that this was a seborrhea keratosis on the ear. It's the superficial spreading melanoma, and here were its characteristics. So this is melanoma in a black person on the ear. And you can only imagine what the surgical consequences of, were that. And we had a very elegant lecture just a few moments ago about how because this was so deep, so thick, 1.8 millimeters, he required sentinel lymph node biopsies, which ended up being in his cervical neck and which were positive. So he has a pretty bad prognosis, better than it used to be with all the immunotherapies, of course. But it's not a seborrheic keratosis. Dark skin does not preclude the diagnosis of malignant melanoma. This one, I think, was a very interesting paper. It's a single center retrospective review of 92 patients who had either mycosis fungoides, most of them were classic MF, or Cesare syndrome in skin of color. They were all Fitzpatrick types three through six. And the point of this paper was that there's a highly variable morphology associated with MF and skin of color. You can see hyperpigmentation, hypopigmentation, a violaceous hue with silvery scale, but when it's tumor stage, the color of the tumor matches the underlying skin tone. So we need early diagnosis and index of suspicion. So let me show you a few examples from my own practice that sort of verify what was in this paper. That's hypopigmented MF. That's not due to therapy. It's not radiation, it's not topical steroid. That's how it presented. And I want you to remember that two diseases can present like this. Sarcoid and MF, always keep them in your differential diagnosis of hypopigmented lesions. MF's more likely to have a little bit of fine scale on it. Sarcoid's a dermal process, so no scale. Look at this gentleman. That's how he walked through the door. He has areas of hypopigmentation. 
You can see one in an anterior axillary line. You can see one at the base of the neck. He has areas of large areas of hyperpigmentation with a little bit of scale up on the shoulder and a tumor on the, on the shoulder already. He was 27 years old. That's MF. He died from it. MF can be very, very indolent and slow progressing, particularly in older individuals. But remember, it can kill. It is a lymphoma. And in skin of color, as noted in that paper, it's highly variable in terms of its presentation. And if you have tumor stage MF, the tumors actually look very much like the underlying skin, except they're exophytic and they're firm. But how about that one? the dorsum of the hand in a black patient. It's a little bit violaceous, a little bit scaly. I think you, just as I, might have thought more about, say, numular eczema, or lichen planus because of the color. That's MF. How do I know? Because I know that MF has a wide variation in its morphologic appearance in skin of color. And I looked at that and said, that could be, I'm going to biopsy it. And it was MF. Traction alopecia, we just had a beautiful talk about alopecia. But remember that this is from a single institution. Over eight years, they had 167 patients with traction alopecia. And although the mean age was over 30, a third of the patients they saw were pediatric, which means you can intervene early and help stop damaging hairstyles. Tight braids, tight ponytails can ultimately lead to frontotemporal hair loss. And there was a marked delay in diagnosis, up to five years before someone actually said, yeah, that's related to your hairstyle. Let me show you an example from my own practice. She came at 14 for mild acne. And while she was there, I said, you have beautiful hair. How are you styling it? She was using heat to straighten it and then pulling it in a tight ponytail. I said, this really isn't healthy for your hair. Ultimately, the thing where the hair grows from is going to give up. And here she showed up at 19 for a wart. And I said, she's still wearing her hair the same way. I said, do you notice you've lost a little bit of your frontal hairline? And I dug up her old picture and showed it to her. And she said, yeah, I, d I really didn't listen to you. I like wearing my hair this way. I said, you know there's going to be a problem. This is 19. She comes two weeks before her wedding at 23. And she asks, can I fix this? No, I can't. Early intervention, very important. This is interesting, post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, more common the darker the skin tone. It actually decreases quality of life. Of course, you know sunlight protection. You can use triple combination or not terribly severe chemical peeling, azelaic acid, vitamin C, cysteamine, we talked about that yesterday and low fluence laser therapy, all mentioned in this nice article. And this is my article, I threw this one in, because it highlights a very interesting phenomenon. In the Caribbean, in India, and in the Philippines, people with dark complexions are at a disadvantage socially and economically. So they use topical agents to lighten normal skin. They're not treating anything. There are things that are mild and safe, but hydroquinone can be dangerous because it can cause exogenous ochronosis. Mercury is very effective at lightening skin, but it can cause hepatorenal disease, as can glutathione, which is administered by IV infusion to lighten the skin. All of these are used even in this country, especially by people who come from those other areas to live here. And what we did is we analyzed a Google search trends and found out that the people who were interested in lightening their skin were those of skin of color. Most of the inquiries were during the summer, because that's when we think we need to look our best. And they were from states which had high ethnic diversity. The darker the blue, the more the inquiries about lightening the skin. And then surgery, 
you know, what's our real concern about surgery and skin of color? Avoiding keloid formation and avoiding dyschromia. And here are some tips in this very nice article. Use non-absorbable sutures that have low reactivity, nylon and polypropylene. Take the sutures out a little earlier. Instead of seven days, Maybe you can get away with five days and put some Steri-Strips on. If it's on the trunk, instead of 14 days, get away with 10 days and put some Steri-Strips. Or don't even put sutures in if you don't really need to. You can use liquid wound adhesive, octal cyanocryacrylate, and Steri-Strips instead of sutures entirely, and make sure that you warn people of the potential risk in skin of color of surgical interventions. And this is my last issue, human papillomavirus vaccination trends, trends in adolescents between 2015 and 2020. You can see as we went from 15 to 20, the vaccination, HPV vaccination uptake got better. What factors increased the vaccination rate? A little older age, healthcare provider's recommendation do you recommend HP vaccination to your patients? And skin of color. Those who belong to skin of color group actually have a higher vaccination rate than those who don't. And so we see adolescents for acne, for eczema, for warts. Our recommendations can help reinforce that positive trend. All that from recent literature, skin, we take care of it. It comes in all variety of colors and shades, and we need to deliver optimum care to everyone. So watch, learn from the literature. Thank you very much.